Oh, hey, Sam. Oh, hey, Bev. What you drinking over there? I just opened an oldie but goodie. It's one of my favorites. It's a Mad Tree Shade, which is a blackberry tart ale with sea salt. That sounds awesome. I've never heard of that one before. Oh, you haven't? I feel Mm -hmm. like I've drank it maybe three or four times on the podcast already. Oh. (laughs) Um, But I mean, in all fairness, we've recorded how many episodes? A lot. Over (laughs) a hundred. With our mini-sodes. Yes. (laughs) To be fair. To be fair. (laughs) <laughs> what'd you open over there so i opened the copper can moscow mule Ooh! and it's a can with craft vodka ginger beer and lime juice and i put it in a copper mug love it i'm so fancy over here <laughs> it is fancy <laughs> and welcome to we drink and we farm things the mini sode Yes, and this is our first mini-sode of 2020, and we're trying out something a little new. We want to make our mini-sodes more about you, and like a little about us, but more about you guys. So that means we need your help. We need you to send farm stories, the things that you find on the internet that you can't even about, and questions that you want to ask us. But We're going to kind of narrow it down for this first episode and just read a couple of your farm stories that have been sent in over the past month or so. Yes, I'm so excited for this. This is going to be a lot of fun. We've been sitting on some really good ones. so It's been very difficult for us. We were like, no, we have to savor them all in our first mini-sode. Yes. So if you thought we were ignoring you, we weren't. We were just having some patience. (laughs) That is right. And our drink peep this episode is at Honey Creek Homestead over on the Instagram. So cheers, lady. Yes, cheers. And now let's get into our farm stories. Our first farm story is from someone we talked about recently. Her name is Brandy Leahy, and she and her husband run Cimarron Prairie Farms. And she's actually a, a listener that sent us beer That was made out of her beer hops. Oh, and it was so good. So cool to receive beer in the mail, too. Just saying. Mm -hmm. And this letter came with a package she sent us. So it starts off by saying, hi, Bev and Sam. Thank you so much for featuring the beer we made with our hops. You've made our day. Just a little background on our farm. We are located in southwest Kansas, like the very southwest corner, actually. I believe there might be only three to four other hop farms in the state of Kansas that I'm aware of, but we are the only one within a 200 mile radius for sure. There are only two breweries, Dodge City Brewing in Dodge City, Kansas City, and Flat Mountain Brewhouse in Garden City, Kansas, within 150 miles of us, and we were able to sell both breweries some of our hops this year. I am a nurse turned farmer. My husband is a fourth gen farmer who farms with his dad, but helps in the hop yard when he can. My dad, who is re- is a retired old and gas field worker, is a- my right hand man. And my brother, who lives in Alaska, is a monetary contributor. LOL, winky face. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome to have a brother yes, like that. No kidding. And she goes on to say, some days I wish I was still working as a nurse. Those 12-hour shifts aren't as labor-intensive as a 10-hour day in the hop yard, believe it or not. But it's fun to learn new things, and there aren't any occupations that allow you to drink beer any time of the day that you want. (laughs) This is our third hop growing season, one first year, our first year, because we didn't know what the hell we were doing and still don't know most of the time. Our hops got infested with spider mites, and we weren't able to harvest anything. Mm. We progressed a little bit last year and did better yet this growing season. We only have one acre of hops, which is about 930 plants, and not all of them are the same maturity, so we hope to continue to increase our yields over the next few years. So far in total, we've had five beers made with our hops in them. One of them included 57 pounds of wild sand hill plums we picked from our property for the brewer. We were privileged enough to help to get to help brew one beer at each of the two breweries this year. You can follow our hop farm venture on Facebook 
Cimarron Prairie Farms and on Instagram at Cimarron Prairie Farms. And here's a little info on each of the beers the two of you have as featured on the Flat Mountain Brewhouse menu. So we both got the Hillside Session IPA. And she goes on to explain that in England during World War II, employees could drink a beer on the job even while manufacturing manufacturing weapons. They called these breaks sessions. It was a custom to have two sessions during a four-hour workday. To qualify for a session, you're aiming for an ABV around 5%. The Flat Mountain Brew House Session IPA is named after a popular com- community event near and dear to her- our hearts called Hillside Sessions. Hillside Sessions is a time to showcase local bands of all styles. And that beer's ABV is 5% and the IBU is 59.1. And she also sent us Demeter's Prairie Pale Ale. And this beer's name comes from the Greek goddess of harvest. It is made with local hops from our friend from the Cimarron Prairie Hop Farm. And Steve and Brandy joined them to brew that beer. And that ABV is 6.1% with an IBU of 34.4. And she says, I hope you enjoy your beer, which we totally did. She really enjoys listening to our podcast and that we drink different things on each episode. And she closes out the letter by saying, our one farm rule is that we have to sit down and relax with at least one beer every day after working out in the hop yard. Cheers and thanks, Brandy. Which I think that's a pretty good rule, personally. Yeah, I think so, too. I might have to implement that rule here. I have not been doing (laughs) enough relaxing or beer enjoying around this place. (laughs) Color us inspired. Yes. So our next story is from Dakota, and she sent it via Facebook Messenger. And she says, hi, my name is Dakota from Southern Michigan, along with my dad, mom, and brother. We have a commercial sheep and crop farm. I've thought about sending a farm story in many times as I binge listen to your podcast while in the tractor, combine, or even gardening, but I just never sat down to do it. As the new year is here and lambing has just begun for us with seven perfect lambs this morning, there's one story that my brother just won't let me forget. Most days run pretty smoothly during lambing, but occasionally there are those days that you have with livestock that you just want to cry and call it quits because nothing seems to go right, which is not at all possible when you have animals and want to make sure that they have everything they could need. Well, a few years back, I was having one of those days, and I, having the smallest hands and arms of all of us, was called to work on this you, I always say that wrong for some reason. It's you. I wanted to say you, but I know that that's not right. You, <laughs> who had been trying to lamb for too long by herself. I thought to myself, great, just what I want right now. My brother and dad had already tried, so it was my turn. I put the OB glove on and started trying, laying in the straw on my belly, laying my head on the you, who was a real trooper for the situation. I kept trying and trying and told my brother, I don't know what's going on, but I can't even get my hand in. He told me I had to keep trying because even he got further than I did. So, come to find out, I was trying, but it was the wrong hole I was trying. (laughs) Oh, poor baby. (laughs) I felt so bad for this you, but it ended just fine with two healthy lambs, and she was relieved, as were all of us. (laughs) (sighs) I have faced the fact that my brother is going to remind me of this forever, so I may as well laugh it off, and also learned that no matter how hard of a day it is to make sure that you look where your hand is trying to go when pulling lambs, for everyone's sake. Thanks for the fun podcast. I love listening. (laughs) Oh, thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, and oh my gosh, I'm not going to lie, that's probably something I would do. Because, like, I wouldn't necessarily look, you know, like, while I was doing it. Because I'd be thinking, like, privacy or I don't know. Or I'd (laughs) be distracted. (laughs) Or I'd be like, oh, this is weird. Why am I doing this? But it's necessary. (laughs) You might have to do that with the goats. You just never know. I might. You're right. Well, I'll be sure and make sure that it's the right hole. Luckily, Mm -hmm. they're a little smaller than full-size lambs. So. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Our next farm story is from Sarah Neiman. 
And it starts out by saying, we have a small hobby farm slash homestead. We have chickens, ducks, pigs, and every year we raise a turkey for the holidays. What we have learned is that a, is to definitely raise two, not one. A solo turkey, even with its chicken and duck friends, always end, ends up crazy. Oh, good to know. Yeah, for sure. Last year's turkey never fit in with a poultry. It was almost murdered by my rooster once. <laughs> I saved it, and he grew up isolated by a fence to keep him safe. Once he was taller than the rooster, he was reintegrated into the main flock. Our birds will all share a run. Our neighbor lost all of her birds to a fox, so we do not let them free range. We had a week vacation with my family at the beach and had a house sitter. She left on Saturday, and we came home to a wonderfully kept house and farm. That night, though, it started pouring, and the basement also started pouring. So many leaks. Me and my husband stayed up till midnight after vacation with two of us, or with two of our own kids and nephews, so little actual relaxation, (laughs) trying to fix the leaks. Finally, he told me to go to bed because I had to be up at 530 to work the next day. Work at home. She tutors online, which is super cool. It still worked, though. (laughs) Yeah. So she showered and went to bed. The next morning between classes online, her husband comes up with a look on his face. He says, I think the turkey is dead. He tells me as he was cleaning up the basement, he heard a commotion and a fox had the turkey by the wing. He shot at the fox with the BB gun to scare it off and it left. Then he went back to work in the basement and heard the fox again. He scared the fox off a second time. He said the turkey was just a lump in the ground. So after I finished my classes for the day, I prepared myself for the worst as I walked out to the run. Remember, all birds stay in the run and the fox did not get in the run. So the fox, for the fox to even be able to bite the turkey, it needed to stick itself outside of the fence. Now the fence is chain linked and the bottom two feet is wrapped in chicken wire. The only place the fox could have grabbed the turkey is at the seam where the door opens. I went down and found a very sad looking turkey. I could see the only damage on the bird was on on the wing. So my only idea is that the fox said to the turkey be my friend let's hold hands and since the turkey was so lonely he stuck his wing through the fence and the fox started eating it and this happened twice remember like i said never have a single turkey they go crazy so i could not let this turkey suffer i had to make a decision it looked as though i could just amputate the wing Now, I'm currently a teacher, and my degree was in biology and environmental science. I am not a doctor or a vet, but do understand that joints are only connected with tendons and ligaments. I called my friend who was a vet tech. She agreed I could cut the wing off at the joint. She said, do you have any sutures? Well, of course not. Well, do you have any dental floss? Yes, I have that. She told me to tie off the wing as tight as I could with the dental floss and use a really sharp knife. So I went inside, grabbed the dental floss and our knife we use for processing the meat chickens. I also took a shot of whiskey because, well, you know, amputations and all. (laughs) Good. (laughs) (laughs) I wrapped the turkey in a towel to hold still. I tied the wing as tight as I could right above the joint, then carefully cut at the joint. The turkey did not make a sound, and I swear it looked relieved that I, when I cut off the rotting wing. I sprayed the heck out of it with blue coat, and the turkey lived happily ever after. Well, until Thanksgiving, when we ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the podcast. It makes me feel like we can do anything we put our minds to. Sarah. And she does not have a farm Instagram account, but she is in the Instagram or in the Facebook group. Oh my gosh, that story is What insane. a badass. <laughs> what a badass. Yes. Crazy turkeys. Who knew? Oh my gosh. No, I had no idea. I'm not going to lie. If I had amputated a turkey's wing, I might have kept it around for a pet for forever just to get to tell that story to everybody that came over. But I don't know. I don't know what kind of quality of life a one-winged turkey would have. Yeah. Peg-winged you know. Pete over there. <laughs> they need him for balance and whatnot. You know, yeah. have you ever seen him spread their wings out? So yeah. maybe it was kinder to eat him for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Man. I think I would have taken a shot after that, too, though. Whew. Oh, yeah. I totally would have also. 
But that's just crazy. That just goes to show that we'll do anything for our animals Mm -hmm. when they realize that Mm -hmm. they need it. (laughs) Absolutely. So our next story is from Julie. And she says, Hi, ladies. I just cracked open a locally grown farmhouse cider, which feels like the appropriate way to begin writing this email. I agree. (laughs) Yeah. I'm a huge fan of your podcast, which has kept me company during work, driving, and farm chores. I'm new to the whole farming thing. Actually, I started listening to your podcast just under a year ago while I lived in downtown Chicago. I discovered you right around the time my husband and I signed the contract on the 1800s farmhouse near Ann Arbor, Michigan, and finalized our decision to move back to our home state after 11 years in the city. We Woo-hoo. moved in. La- oh, yeah. Sorry. Go blue. <laughs> 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 we moved in last June, which was in 2019, and have been loving it ever since. Right now, I've got six chickens and an ambitiously large garden for next summer. But hopefully, one day we'll add pigs and maybe eventually mini meat cows or sheep. Luckily, both my husband and I work from home, so we're able to really dig into this farm life. Ooh, both me and my husband work from home. Anyway, I just wanted to introduce myself and tell you both how much I enjoy the podcast. I particularly like how you focus on keeping it real and not pretending to have the perfect farm life. One of the things I found to be important is respecting that this is all a learning process and things likely won't be perfect the first time around, but that learning and growing is really the most important part of what I'm doing here. I also thought I'd share a farm story. It might not be as interesting as some of the farm stories you've read. I just finished the episode from last summer with the story about Reba the donkey, which was seriously great. Oh, it's our friend Katie from Sticky Holler Farm. (laughs) But I thought I'd share it anyway. So here it goes. When we knew we were finally moving to Michigan, I placed an order for six laying hens from Meyer Hatchery in Ohio. I ordered six different breeds that all have different colored eggs and different feather colors. I spent the first few weeks after we moved in converting one of the old buildings on the property into a nice large coop. The chicks arrived happy and healthy in the mail. The workers at the local post office were thrilled with the small peeping Uh box, uh and all six survived and grew through the summer. By early fall, I was starting to suspect that Mrs. McCarthy, which is my well summer, named after a character from a show I like, might actually be a (laughs) roo. One morning, when I was in our wood shop, which is next to the coop, I heard a startlingly loud cock-a-doodle-doo, and it was official. I poked my head out the door to see Mrs. McCarthy tipping her head back and crowing at the sun. Mm -hmm. I renamed her Father Brown, also a character from the same show. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I wasn't sure what to do about having a roo. I hadn't exactly planned on it, but I had heard that roosters are useful for breeding obviously, (laughs) and keeping away predators. I decided that if he was nice and didn't attack me, I'd let him stay. That lasted a few months, but then one morning in late November, he came at me while I was opening the door to their run, and that was that. I decided we'd butcher him. (laughs) One and done, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Cutthroat. No pun intended. Yeah. That was dark. A few days later, my husband and I went out to shut the door to the chicken's run after the sun had set. I usually try to close them up around sunset, but this evening things got in the way and I did it just a little later than usual. They have a really well-protected predator-proof run, so this isn't really a big deal. We entered the coop and I realized that I only had five chickens on the roost. One was missing, and I quickly realized it was Betty, my barn of elder. We began searching around the coop to see if we could find where she had gone, but we found nothing. No unexpected holes or signs of struggle. I went out to the run and checked there. It had snowed quite a bit that day, so it was easy to see if any animals had come near the run. But there were no tracks, no signs of struggle, no holes in the fencing, nothing. While my husband checked outside of the building, I racked my brain for an idea of what had happened. That morning, I had locked them in the run while I mucked the coop, and I wondered whether or not somehow I had missed Betty when I shooed them into the run and she had gone out the other human-sized door instead. After we confirmed that there was no sign of escape anywhere else, I decided that must have been what had happened, and I sadly closed up the coop with the knowledge that I was now down to just four hens and losing Betty was entirely my own fault. Mm. Before we went back to the house, I decided I wanted to do one last tour around the coop, As I said, my coop is an old converted building on our property, and the south side of the building is lined with old, double-hung windows that have four individual panes of glass on each half of the window. 
One of these windows is on the wall of the coop. As I approached this side on my last tour, I suddenly realized that one of the glass panes had popped out and was lying in the snow. In the dark, our eyes had just totally missed that the pane had fallen out. Overjoyed at finding a clue and that it wasn't my negligence while mucking the coop that had led to the escape, I began searching the trees all around the coop, figuring that Betty must have roosted if she was still alive. After a few minutes, we saw a dark shape in a tree about 50 yards from the coop. It was Betty. She had nested in a branch just above my head, and husband, who was luckily tall, was able to pluck her out of the tree. (laughs) She squawked like crazy, but we got her back into the coop and popped the pane of glass back in place. I was so relieved. What an adventure. And now, a few months later, we've butchered Father Brown, and my hens will begin laying any day now. All five of them. Uh Thanks again for what you're doing, ladies. Cheers, Julie. And P.S., I'm on Instagram at the Lady Jules, and you can feel free to share that on the podcast if you read my farm story. So we did. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and oh my gosh, we had a similar experience a couple of nights ago. We have two younger chickens, um, which is kind of dark, but I, I told you, I haven't told our podcast family yet. But we had a hawk attack a couple days ago. Yeah. And it was, like, super gruesome. Like, I've never seen the aftermath. Like, I saw it, like, out of the corner of my eye, like, fly up with a chicken. And then it landed not far away and was, like, on top of her. And it was pretty graphic. Um, So I'll spare everyone the details. (laughs) But I thought it was, like, a chicken mama that, uh, like, a... A couple months ago, she just, like, came out of nowhere with seven chicks that she went off and hatched. Um, I thought it was that one. But then I was like, no, wait, Larry, Moe, and Carly, you're all there. Because <laughs> there's three of them <laughs> that look yeah. almost identical. So I think it was one of her babies, maybe. But anyways, two of the other babies from that batch decided it would be super fun to fly up on top of the chicken coop. Oh. like right before sunset and my husband was going to go close it. And I was like, you're going to want to go like throw snowballs at them now. So they don't end up in the trees. <laughs> well, they did end up in the trees and we had to like shake the tree, try to throw snowballs at the bird, which those birds like really know how to balance. Yeah. One bird like flew over to a different tree and was like probably 75 feet in the air. And I was like, well, that one's not coming down. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the other one we had to like throw like, uh, some kind of rake at the tree to get her to go down and she did end up coming down and we put her in the coop but the uh-huh. other one was super tiny and I was like you're gonna be frozen dead at the top of this tree because it was gonna be like nine degrees that night and I woke up and she was still alive so oh if you think your birds are cold in your coop you are wrong <laughs> <laughs> As long as it's not windy, they're fine. Even if it is windy, they're probably fine. Because Sam's birds stayed up in a tree 75 feet in the air when it was 9 degrees and kind of windy out. So, Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, it's kind of scary when they do that because it's super hard to see where they're at, too. And, and they're not moving. So I'm glad that your husband was able to reach up and pluck that chicken out of the tree (laughs) so much easier than (laughs) throwing snowballs at them (laughs) you realize how inadequate you are as a human when you can't throw snow that high in the air (laughs) (laughs) right you're like why can't i uh chicken outsmarted me dang it Uh, dang it (laughs) jerks (laughs) well be sure and send us your farm stories we'll do another mini so like this as soon as we have enough of them to do I thought this was a lot of fun. Did you think this was a lot of fun? Heck yeah. And if you don't have a farm story, but you find something that you really can't even about on the internet and you think our listenership needs to know, you can post those in the Facebook group because I've been saving those. Or you can email them to us if you want it to be a surprise to everyone. Um, Or you can just ask us questions. We like to answer your questions. Yeah, because sometimes we don't know what you guys want to know because we're not mind readers, right? No, I I mean, I don't have that ability. (laughs) No, no, neither. Last time I checked. Yeah, but you can absolutely email those to us at drinkandfarm at gmail.com or send them through Facebook Messenger or Instagram. So be sure and hit the subscribe button and download the episode when you listen. And leave us a review over on Apple Podcast if you haven't already to be entered into a monthly drawing. We read one a week on our regular episode. 
And do us a favor and share this episode over on the Instagram in your stories. Not only will we reshare it, but we'll also send you a promo code just for that episode that will give you a percentage off in our shop. And don't forget to tag us at Drink and Farm. Yes. And check out the show notes for social media links, merch shop links, all the other fun things we always throw out there. It's a good resource to check out. And thanks for listening, you guys. Yeah, this was fun. We will have a couple minisodes for you next month. So please send us your stuff so we can put those together for you. Yes. And until next time, drink, farm, and and give give zero zero clucks. (laughs) Bye, guys. Bye. We drink things. We farm things. We drink and farm things. First Saturday Lime is a non-toxic, super strong drying agent derived from 100% natural products. First Saturday Lime has the ability to dry out insects, eggs, and larvae. It's effective as a treatment for infestations, as well as preventing those little buggers from infiltrating your coops and barns in the first place. This pesticide alternative is something we use regularly on our farms, and it's a total game changer no matter which season we are in. Not only does it keep the bugs away, but it also helps soak up ammonia and tame down the stink in your animal enclosures. So go to FirstSaturdayLime.com and use code DRINK at checkout to get 30% off and free shipping for this month only. So if you're listening post-January 2020, you could still use the same code and get 20% off and free shipping.